Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present this week's episode of Who Killed, featuring the Lake Waco Murders. Hello and welcome to Who Killed, a Slow Burn Media production. I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and on this week's episode, we'll be looking into the case of the Lake Waco Murders, a case that occurred in 1982. And just to give you a little bit of a background into how we come across our cases or choose the cases that we do decide to produce, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes it's driven by a listener, sometimes it's driven by personal interests, and on this particular situation, it was driven during the research of the Austin uh, case that I just covered about the yogurt shop murders. And they kept referencing the Lake Waco case, and I was unfamiliar with the tragedy that had occurred in 1982 at Lake Waco in the summer. And this case is extremely interesting. This one does have a resolution, but to say that this is a clean-cut case is definitely a stretch. Uh, There has been a lot of controversy as far as who committed the crimes, whether or not these cases were uh, necessarily forced confessions, or if they possibly even executed the wrong individual. So this case has lots of twists and turns. So this will just be the first episode of a few on the Lake Waco case, because again, this is another case where three teenagers who were in the primes of their lives were literally struck down while out having fun in the middle of summer stabbed to death in what can only be considered an absolute horrible tragedy. So join me this week as we explore the case of the Lake Waco murders. Shockingly, it's already been 36 years since the bodies of the three teenagers, Raylene Rice, Jill Montgomery, and Kenneth Franks were found by two fishermen brutally stabbed just outside of Lake Waco. This was on July 3rd, 1982, and Franks' body was found propped up against a tree. He had his sunglasses still over his eyes, and then the women were found with their throats slashed as well as being tied up with their own clothing or possible clothing of a towel. Now, initially, there were no suspects or motive in the stabbing deaths, and the crimes pretty much traumatized every first responder, and it really horrified the Waco community. These three teens weren't just killed. They were bound and gagged and literally slaughtered. The bodies were found in a set of secluded woods near Lake Waco, a very popular spot for many of the citizens of the community. Kenneth Franks had a surprising 20 stab wounds. Jill Montgomery suffered 17, as well as a cut through the throat, and Raylene Rice was stabbed nine times. Now, two boys found the bodies in the wooded area near the lake and they were actually on their way to go fishing and again they had the classic uh story of i i thought it was a mannequin or a prank and i thought that the bodies were just not real bodies until we got up close and oh little did we know that these were actually the bodies of um some really young people that really did not deserve what had occurred. So, officers said Franks had been stabbed in the chest near the heart, and the two girls were found nude with several stab wounds in the chest. Now, the throats of all three were also slashed, so this was definitely a killing where the intent was to kill and not just to, you know, harm. It was a very shocking and traumatic moment for a lot of people, especially in the community. And I can only imagine what it was like for anybody who had responded to the original call about a possible mannequin or 
you know, some sort of prank being held out at Lake Waco. The idea that somebody actually had killed three young teenagers was probably the last thing that anybody had even come close to reconciling with. So after the bodies were found, it was clear to officials that this was something that they needed to deal with as soon as possible. The teenagers had been reported missing around 9.45 a.m. when Kenneth's father, Richard Franks, had found one of the cars at the park, and that was one of the vehicles that one of the girls had been driving. Now, at the time, CSI was pretty, I don't know, minimal, and a lot of work was basically revolving around fingerprints and maybe blood types, but officers did at least spend the afternoon examining the abandoned car. Now, reports at the time do state that Waco Police Detective Ramon Salinas said Franks was found fully clothed and he did not know if the girls had been sexually assaulted. Now, again, this was at that time. Now, Salinas said that they were bound with their hands behind their back and stabbed in the heart area. Quote, they were bound with their own clothing. And then Salinas went on to say that the bodies were found about 75 feet apart and about 200 yards from the water in a pretty deeply wooded and weeded area. Now, Richard Franks told police that the two girls had picked up his son around, uh, I don't know, Tuesday night and that he had expected him home around midnight. But when he woke at 430 he was surprised not to find his son at home. Now, Franks did say that it appeared the teenagers had been abducted from the park because he found Mrs. Rice's vehicle, or I should say Miss Rice's vehicle, that morning. A police spokesman in Waxahachie, about 30 miles south of Dallas, had said authorities were unsure of why the girls, both students at the high school, had made the 70-mile, that 70, 70-mile drive to Waco. One of the first police officers on the scene was Truman Simmons. Now, if you want to think about your favorite cop in any television show or documentary or 48 hours or first 48 this is your guy Truman Simmons is one of those real true detectives and they investigated the case for about eight weeks and it was eventually suspended because there was really a lack of credible leads but it wasn't long before they did actually have a little bit of a nibble. And that came when Munir Muhammad Deeb, the owner of a local gas station, had been known to have a confrontational relationship with Franks. And he was actually arrested after having told two young women that he was actually the one that committed the murders. Not a good idea to run around telling people you committed a murder, even if you didn't. Still not a good idea. He was arrested. Now, he did pass a polygraph test, but that still doesn't mean that he is 100% out of the eyes or crosshairs of the investigation. The story basically is straight out of a Dallas episode. I mean, seriously, you have a long list of lies, a murder for hire plot, drugs, prostitution of, I mean, you name it, it happened in this case. Deeb was arrested again nearly a year later and three accomplices were also arrested. The gas station owner had taken out a life insurance policy on one of his employees and she had bore a right a really striking resemblance to Montgomery. And police had theorized that Deeb hired David Wayne Spence, Anthony Melendez, and Gilbert Melendez to murder the employee, but killed Montgomery instead and killed Rice and Franks because they were witnesses. 
nothing like a case of mistaken identity to lead to a triple homicide. So, as I mentioned before, two boys found the bodies, and they were found bound and gagged. And this was around 6.45 p.m. on Wednesday. Now, Miss Montgomery had been living at the Methodist home in Waco and working at Fort Fisher, which was a park housing, the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame Museum, as well as headquarters for a ranger company. And this was all dictated to everybody through Bob Smith, who was the park director. Now, she had recently moved to Waxahachie to live with her mother and had returned to Waco to pick up her final check at Fort Fisher the day before her body was found. Now, quote, Smith said that she was a very attractive young lady, always bubbling with personality. Now, Miss Montgomery had been formerly released from the Methodist home July 10th, said director, and I'm not making this up, Jack Daniels. Franks had been a resident of the home for about I don't know, a few years before he was released to his father on April 16th. Now, the home is owned and operated by the Methodist Church to care for children who are not able to live in, say, let's say, their home environment. So, police investigators backed by the Texas Rangers from Fort Fisher, scoured the area near the lake that following Thursday. Now, the teenagers were reported missing about 9.45 a.m. that Wednesday after Richard Franks, as I mentioned before, came forward to say that his son had not returned home. So, Waco Police Detective Ramon Salinas said the slain child was found fully clothed and he did not know if the girls had been sexually assaulted and I did mention that before and of course in all tragedies those early determinations are liable to change so in Texas unlike a lot of states there is a thing called the Texas Rangers and the Texas Rangers aren't just a baseball team they are actually a law enforcement agency that assists and leads a lot of the top investigations in the state the rangers actually became involved because one of the victims was actually a member of the employees at the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame, as I mentioned earlier. So, nothing like having a summer job where you're actually helping an investigative unit, and then one day you end up being a victim, and the company or group that you work for are now in charge of finding your killer. I would say that they have a little bit of a vested interest, in my opinion. Things kind of stood at a standstill for a while. And it took a while for investigators to really start to hone in on who they thought may have been the perpetrators of these horrible crimes. And the name David Wayne Spence was one that kept coming across their table. And I can't deny that this guy is probably not the best guy to hang out with, nor should you ever... um, be associated with them. But, um, as we've seen in other cases, having tunnel vision and having a guy right off the bat or within the first week of who you think may have committed the crime, it can lead to what we call in this world, I guess, tunnel vision. And that also will lead to a whole slew of other issues. So, as I said, I saw in the yogurt shop murders and many other cases that when a community is left without any answers, the speculation is what really begins to kick into high gear. And the longer that this case took to solve, the more opportunities there were for the public and the media to poke holes in their work. And let's take a moment to hear from this week's sponsor. I can't thank this week's sponsor enough, Podcorn. They make connecting podcasters with sponsorship opportunities such as host-read ads, topical discussions, and interview segments easy as can be. 
They took what had been a labor-intensive part of my podcasting process and make it easy for me to focus on what we as creators do best, create. If you're looking for a way to monetize the hard work you put into your podcast, then look no further than Podcorn. You set the rate you believe to be fair and deal with the brands directly. There is no middleman. And at Podcorn, you will never give up any rights to your podcast. Their mission is to make sure creators like me are compensated in an appropriate manner. You can check them out on their website, podcorn.com. They have packages for podcasts of all sizes. And again, I can't thank them enough for making my life easier. I've provided a link in the show notes to check out what Podcorn can do for you. Now, as a member of the media myself, I hate this aspect of the business. Uh, The speculation can create red herrings and really send cops down a path that will only waste their time and really not end up with an answer that anybody is looking for. It is important to keep our public officials on their toes, but I don't think it's our job to solve cases or question the methodology of trained investigators.
few suspects. Now, David Wayne Spence, I've mentioned before, he was thought to have been hired by one Munir Deeb, who had owned the convenience store, who had issues with one Kenneth Franks. Now, Deeb was eventually convicted in 1985 of hiring Spence to kill Gail Kelly Rays, who was a woman who had spurned his advances for a $20,000 life insurance policy. So basically what we're looking at as Deeb hired Spence to kill Kelly, but unfortunately Spence being the not sharpest tool in the shed mistakenly thought that this other person was Kelly and therefore decided to kill that person. So, basically, this is all a case of mistaken identity. So, Deeb remained actually on death row until 1991 when the Court of Criminal Appeals actually awarded him a new trial on a ruling that had testimony from a jail inmate and that basically should never have been allowed in trial. Spence, on the other hand, was still on death row, and the two other people, the Melendez brothers, not the Menendez, Melendez brothers, were sentenced to life. Now, Deeb was a native of Jordan, and he had said that he had planned to move back to Saudi Arabia with his parents. And a change in the Texas law allows a judge to spell out what constitutes reasonable doubt rather than allowing each juror to make their own interpretation. Quote, what is reasonable doubt, she asked. It's different for you than it is for me. And basically what he said was Special Prosecutor David Chapman said that he's not sure why Deeb was acquitted. Quote, I think these jurors, the main problem was, this is a 10-year-old case, Chapman said. Quote, it's always difficult to convict older cases as they become old. It's just the way it goes. And basically, I I recently completed the Carlton Stowers book, the 1986 book, Careless Whispers, which was an extremely detailed version of the killings. Although I've noticed online some people question whether or not he had straight loyalty to the prosecutors or whether or not he was siding with just the facts in the case. But his book is definitely on the side of the prosecutor and the families, but I don't think you can blame him for the account he gave. I mean, as a reporter, you only have so much to work with. And in Stowers' case, it's not like he was the only one that thought that they had the right guys. I mean, when Spence was granted a retrial in 1992, Stowers was shocked. But, you know, he said at the time, the thing is that's distressing here is there are families of these kids who have been waiting for justice for 10 years and it still hasn't been served. That's the travesty. It is heartbreaking. Unquote. Now, the family's hatred and the retrial and everything that goes along with it is understandable. I would not want to be a part of that if one of my family members were convicted and then the person that had been convicted of their killing was eventually brought back into court and possibly being released. So one of the members of the family had compared the verdict to having another death in the family. So at this point, you had Deeb, who had been freed, and when asked by a reporter you know, what she had hoped he would do next, her response was, I just hope he leaves the country. I just, I mean, that's the only thing I hope. And on the night of the murders, <laughs> this person had a vision of two men brutally killing three teenagers and transporting their bodies. Now, she had fallen asleep after work, and upon awakening, she was startled by a vivid image of a car moving slowly through a wooded landscape. 
Now, she also made out three males on the inside and two females, a bearded driver and an Indian-looking man, were clearly older than the other three teenagers. And in her vision, the Indian man reached over the blonde girl and stabbed the boy with a knife. The car pulled over. The driver removed the boy's body and dumped it off the road. The brunette girl ran, but the driver caught her and forced her to watch the other man put a knife into the throat of her friend. She broke away and ran again, but was caught and brutally beaten before she was finally murdered. That same night, Glenda T., psychic extraordinaire, reportedly had a similar experience, and she had described two men but added a third one in the background, taking the teenagers with them in a red van. Now, they had killed them near a road. On the arm of the leader was the tattoo of an eagle. Now, Glenda had tried contacting the victims through automatic writing and said she'd heard from Raylene, who had indicated that a bra was around her leg. That was an accurate detail that was not reported in the papers, and, quote, Raylene could not identify the killers. In the meantime, the police brought in a renowned psychic. At the scene, he said there had been three men involved, and one of them had murdered the kids in a flat-bottom boat. He believed that a dark-haired woman in her 20s would offer important information. In fact, the detectives had their eye on a 19-year-old brunette, her boyfriend, David Spence, as I mentioned before, and he was in prison for another crime. He was also acquainted with Munir Deeb, who had allegedly confessed to a friend of the victims that he had killed them. There was a rumor that he had taken out an insurance policy on one of the girls and that one of the victims actually had resembled the person that the insurance policy was taken out on. So, Detective Truman Simons surmised that Deeb had hired Spence to murder the girl for the payout, but Spence made the mistaken identity and ended up killing Jill and her friends. And that is kind of where we stand today. So, the next thing that happened, and this is kind of where I'm going with another one of my shows, is that I would say what was used to convict them was a little bit on the lines of what I would say is junk science. And I say that as junk science. And so Spence was tried and convicted and two of his accomplices, the Melendez brothers, were also convicted. Now, they used, quote, bite mark analysis, which is what I consider to be junk science, that was connected to Spence and a bruise on one of the victims. Now, this was one of those things where in the 1980s, there wasn't a lot of, you know, DNA that we expect to see today. And... I guess back then bite mark analysis had been used in the Bundy case, which had just been a few years prior. So it wasn't that crazy to think that they could possibly get away with using this as an excuse to, you know, find him guilty. But the biggest issue that occurred in the whole case was the fact that there was really nothing physically evidence-wise, that tied these guys to the case. Strands of hair, pubic hairs, you know, semen, all that stuff that would have come from, you know, the suspects it wasn't found. And, you know, that car that was used by Spence had supposedly transported these victims. There was nothing to be found in there, and they actually did examine the vehicle. So what in the world happened between the time that they were brought into questioning and the time that they were one can not, you know, not convicted, but charged and then convicted. I mean, the amount of steps that they had to go through if these people weren't guilty is insane. 
And that is all of the more reason why I'm going to keep this first episode short because there's so much more to get into and I really don't want to spoil the whole case because the fact that I found this case while doing research on the Yo- the Austin yogurt shop murders is just crazy because, you know, you think you know everything about true crime when you're in this business, but you really don't know shit. <laughs> and uh, not to put it bluntly, but that's the truth. And you will really see new things every single time you open up your laptop and a new case, a new issue, a wrongful conviction, you name it, it can happen. And to think that we can sit here and say that, oh yes, everything's been done very, you know, uh, on the up and up and all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. I don't think that can be said for any case. So just saying it might be time to take a step back, look at everything before these cases are actually brought to trial, and let's just not try to fill in a idea about what we think happened. Let's not make that case about what our theory is let's base our theory off of the evidence that is where i think we need to go and with that being said until next week i look forward to talking to you as always be safe A big thanks to everybody who's been tuning in to Who Killed and My Passion Case over the past few months. I've really enjoyed talking with all the different podcasters as well as exploring these new cases. And again, I drop new episodes of Who Killed every Friday as well as My Passion Case every Monday. I would also like to mention that if you would like to support the show you can click on the donate button on the left-hand side of slowburnmedia.com, and that is slow minus the W. And any amount helps. It really does help keep this podcast going. I will be representing Who Killed, Who Killed Amy Mahalovic in my passion case on Podcast Row at CrimeCon 2020 this May in Orlando. It's definitely a bucket list item for any hardcore true crime fan. And if you'd like to save money on the ticket, I have a promo code for you, and that is Amy2020. So again, if you guys enjoy this podcast, uh, you can also help support the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to right now. And again, those do help keep the cases that I cover in the spotlight. So if you'd like to stay up to date on the cases I have covered and the new shows that are coming down the pipeline, Please follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. And thank you guys again so much for listening this week. And until next time, be safe. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to. 
but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. Hello out there. Yes, hello out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimbut the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!